Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the January 2022 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook and discussion of Opposed Book Worship from May 1930 by Mao Zedong. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So we'll be reading the version hosted at Marxists.org, the Marxists Internet Archive, transcription by the Maoist Documentation Project, HTML last revised in 2004. So let's get into the audiobook. 1. No investigation, no right to speak. Unless you have investigated a problem, you will be deprived of the right to speak on it. Isn't that too harsh? Not in the least. When you have not probed into a problem, into the present facts, and its past history, and know nothing of its essentials, whatever you say about it will undoubtedly be nonsense. Talking nonsense solves no problems, as everyone knows, so why is it unjust to deprive you of the right to speak? Quite a few comrades always keep their eyes shut and talk nonsense, and for a communist, that is disgraceful. How can a communist keep his eyes shut and talk nonsense? It won't do. It won't do. You must investigate, you must not talk nonsense. 2. To investigate a problem is to solve it. You can't solve a problem? Well, get down and investigate the present facts and its past history. When you have investigated the problem thoroughly, you will know how to solve it. Conclusions invariably come after investigation and not before. Only a blockhead cudgels his brains on his own or together with a group to quote, find a solution or evolve an idea without making any investigation. It must be stressed that this cannot possibly lead to any effective solution or any good idea. In other words, he is bound to arrive at a wrong solution and a wrong idea. There are not a few comrades doing inspection work, as well as guerrilla leaders and cadres newly in office, who like to make political pronouncements the moment that they arrive at a place, and who strut about, criticizing this and condemning that, when they have only seen the surface of things, or minor details. Such purely subjective, nonsensical talk is indeed detestable. These people are bound to make a mess of things, lose the confidence of the masses, and prove incapable of solving any problem at all. When they come across difficult problems, quite a number of people in leading positions simply heave a sigh without being able to solve them. They lose patience and ask to be transferred on the ground that they, quote, have not the ability and cannot do the job. These are coward's words. Just get moving on your own two legs, go the rounds of every section placed under your charge, and inquire into everything, as Confucius did, and then you will be able to solve the problems, however little is your ability. For although your head may be empty before you go outdoors, it will be empty no longer when you return, but will contain all sorts of material necessary for the solution of the problems, and that is how problems are solved. Must you go out of doors? Not necessarily. You can call a fact-finding meeting of people familiar with the situation in order to get at the source of what you call a difficult problem and come to know how it stands now, and then it will be easy to solve your difficult problem. Investigation may be likened to the long months of pregnancy and solving a problem to the day of birth. To investigate a problem is indeed to solve it. And there's a footnote there when Mao says, inquire into everything as Confucius did. This is quoting the Confucian Analects, Book 3, Pa Yi, quote, when Confucius entered the ancestral temple, he inquired into everything. Back to the text and on to section 3, oppose book worship. Whatever is written in a book is right, such is still the mentality of culturally backward Chinese peasants. Strangely enough, within the Communist Party, there are also people who always say in a discussion, show me where it's written in the book. When we say that a directive of a higher organ of leadership is correct, that is not just because it comes from a higher organ of leadership, but because its contents conform with both the objective and subjective circumstances of the struggle and meet its requirements. It is quite wrong to take a formalistic attitude and blindly carry out directives without discussing and examining them in the light of actual conditions simply because they come from a higher organ. It is the mischief done by this formalism which explains why the line and tactics of the party do not take deeper root among the masses. To carry out a directive of a higher organ blindly 
and seemingly without any disagreement, is not really to carry it out, but is the most artful way of opposing or sabotaging it. The method of studying the social sciences exclusively from the book is likewise extremely dangerous and may even lead one onto the road of counter-revolution. Clear proof of this is provided by the fact that whole batches of Chinese communists who confine themselves to books in their study of the social sciences have turned into counter-revolutionaries. When we say that Marxism is correct, it is certainly not because Marx was a prophet, but because his theory has been proved correct in our practice and in our struggle. We need Marxism in our struggle. In our acceptance of his theory, no such formalization of mystical notion as that of prophecy ever enters our minds. Many who have read Marxist books have become renegades from the revolution, whereas illiterate workers often grasp Marxism very well. Of course, we should study Marxist books, but this study must be integrated with our country's actual conditions. We need books, but we must overcome book worship, which is divorced from the actual situation. How can we overcome book worship? The only way is to investigate the actual situation. Section 4. Without investigating the actual situation, there is bound to be an idealist appraisal of class forces and an idealist guidance in work, resulting either in opportunism or in putschism. Do you doubt this conclusion? Facts will force you to accept it. Just try and appraise the political situation or guide the struggle without making any investigation, and you will see whether or not such appraisal or guidance is groundless and idealist, and whether or not it will lead to opportunist or putschist errors. Quick comment, a putsch is like a coup, so this is kind of like, I guess, conspiratorial adventurism, you could say, going on. Certainly it will. It is not because of failure to make careful plans before taking action but because of failure to study the specific social situation carefully before making the plans, as often happens in our Red Army guerrilla units. Officers of the Lee Kuei type do not discriminate when they punish men for offenses. As a result, the offenders feel that they have been unfairly treated, many disputes ensue, and the leaders lose all prestige. Does not this happen frequently in the Red Army? We must wipe out idealism, and guard against all opportunist and putschist errors before we can succeed in winning over the masses and defeating the enemy. The only way to wipe out idealism is to make the effort and investigate the actual situation. There's a footnote there. Li Kuei was a hero in the well-known Chinese novel Shui Hu Chuan, or Heroes of the Marshes, which describes the peasant war that occurred toward the end of the Northern Song Dynasty, 960 to 1127. He was simple, outspoken, and very loyal to the revolutionary cause of the peasants, but also crude and tactless. Back to the text and on to section 5. The aim of social and economic investigation is to arrive at a correct appraisal of class forces and then to formulate correct tactics for the struggle. This is our answer to the question, why do we have to investigate social and economic conditions? Accordingly, the object of our investigation is all the social classes, and not fragmentary social phenomena. Of late, the comrades in the 4th Army of the Red Army have generally given attention to the work of investigation, but the method many of them employ is wrong. The results of their investigation are therefore as trivial as a grocer's accounts, or resemble the many strange tales a country bumpkin hears when he comes to town, or are like a distant view of a populous city from a mountaintop. This kind of investigation is of little use and cannot achieve our main purpose. Our main purpose is to learn the political and economic situation of the various social classes. The outcome of our investigation should be a picture of the present situation of each class and the ups and downs of its development. For example, when we investigate the composition of the peasantry, not only must we know the number of owner peasants, semi-owner peasants, and tenant peasants who are differentiated according to tenancy relationships, but more especially, we must know the number of rich peasants, middle peasants, and poor peasants, who are differentiated according to class or stratum. When we investigate the composition of the merchants, not only must we know the number in each trade, such as grain, clothing, medicinal herbs, etc., but more especially, we must know the number of small merchants, middle merchants, and big merchants. We should investigate not only the state of each trade, but more especially the class relations within it. 
we should investigate the relationships not only between the different trades, but more especially between the different classes. Our chief method of investigation must be to dissect the different social classes, the ultimate purpose being to understand their interrelations, to arrive at a correct appraisal of class forces, and then to formulate the correct tactics for the struggle, defining which classes constitute the main force in the revolutionary struggle, which classes are to be won over as allies, and which classes are to be overthrown. This is our sole purpose. What are the social classes requiring investigation? They are the industrial proletariat, the handicraft workers, the farm laborers, the poor peasants, the urban poor, the lumpen proletariat, the master handicraftsmen, the small merchants, the middle peasants, the rich peasants, the landlords, the commercial bourgeoisie, the industrial bourgeoisie. In our investigation, we should give attention to the state of all these classes or strata. Only the industrial proletariat and the industrial bourgeoisie are absent in the areas where we are now working, and we constantly come across all the others. Our tactics of struggle are tactics in relation to all these classes and strata. Another serious shortcoming in our past investigations has been the undue stress on the countryside to the neglect of the towns, so that many comrades have always been vague about our tactics toward the urban poor and the commercial bourgeoisie. The development of the struggle has enabled us to leave the mountains for the plains. We have descended physically, but we are still up in the mountains mentally. We must understand the towns as well as the countryside, or we shall be unable to meet the needs of the revolutionary struggle. There are two footnotes off of that section. The first one regarding comrades in the 4th Army of the Red Army giving attention to the work of investigation. Comrade Mao Zedong has always laid great stress on investigation, regarding social investigation as the most important task and the basis for defining policy in the work of leadership. Comment. One of the audiobooks that we have up on the channel is an analysis of the social classes in China in the 20s, and it is, I think, really impressive. I would encourage any, but maybe I'll link it in the description. All right, continuing. The work of investigation was gradually developed in the 4th Army of the Red Army on Comrade Mao Zedong's initiative. He stipulated that social investigation should be a regular part of the work, and the political department of the Red Army prepared detailed forms covering such items as the state of the mass struggle, the condition of the reactionaries, the economic life of the people, and the amount of land owned by each class in the rural areas. Wherever the Red Army went, it first made itself familiar with the class situation in the locality, and then formulated slogans suited to the needs of the masses. Comment. Anybody in orgs where this kind of work is being done regularly? You know, I read descriptions like this, and then I look at what kind of hijinks the USA is up to where people can't even agree you know on whether obvious reactionaries are like quote leftists or not anyway it's stunning um, continuing on the subject of leaving the mountains for the plains here the mountains are the Qingkong mountain area along the borders of Qiangxi and Hunan provinces the plains are those in southern Qiangxi and western Fujian in January 1929 comrade Mao Zedong led the main force of the 4th Army of the Red Army down from the Qingkong Mountains to southern Qiangxi and western Fujian in order to set up two large revolutionary base areas. Back to the main text and on to section 6. Victory in China's revolutionary struggle will depend on the Chinese comrades' understanding of Chinese conditions. The aim of our struggle is to attain socialism via the stage of democracy. In this task, the first step is to complete the democratic revolution by winning the majority of the working class and arousing the peasant masses and the urban poor for the overthrow of the landlord class, imperialism, and the Kuomintang regime. The next step is to carry out the socialist revolution, which will follow on the development of this struggle. The fulfillment of this great revolutionary task is no simple or easy job and will depend entirely on correct and firm tactics on the part of the proletarian party. If its tactics of struggle are wrong or irresolute and wavering, the revolution will certainly suffer temporary defeat. It must be borne in mind that the bourgeois parties, too, constantly discuss their tactics of struggle. They are considering how to spread reformist influences among the working class so as to mislead it 
and turn it away from the Communist Party leadership, how to get the rich peasants to put down the uprisings of the poor peasants, and how to organize gangsters to suppress the revolutionary struggles. In a situation when the class struggle grows increasingly acute and is waged at close quarters, the proletariat has to depend for its victory entirely on the correct and firm tactics of struggle of its own party, the Communist Party. A Communist Party's correct and unswerving tactics of struggle can in no circumstance be created by a few people sitting in an office. They emerge in the course of mass struggle, that is, through actual experience. Therefore, we must at all times study social conditions and make practical investigations. Those comrades who are inflexible, conservative, formalistic, and groundlessly optimistic think that the present tactics of struggle are perfect, that the Book of Documents of the party's Sixth National Congress guarantees lasting victory, and that one can always be victorious merely by adhering to the established methods. These ideas are absolutely wrong and have nothing in common with the idea that communists should create favorable new situations through struggle. They represent a purely conservative line. Unless it is completely discarded, this line will cause great losses to the revolution and do harm to these comrades themselves. There are obviously some comrades in our Red Army who are content to leave things as they are, who do not seek to understand anything thoroughly, and are groundlessly optimistic, and they spread the fallacy that this is proletarian. They eat their fill and sit dozing in their offices all day long without ever moving a step and going out among the masses to investigate. Whenever they open their mouths, their platitudes make people sick. To awaken these comrades, we must raise our voices and cry out to them, change your conservative ideas without delay, replace them by progressive and militant communist ideas, get into the struggle, go among the masses, and investigate the facts. There's a footnote there. The Book of Documents referenced by Mao consisted of the resolutions adopted at the Sixth National Congress of the Communist Party of China in July 1928, including the political resolution and the resolutions on the peasant question, the land question, and the organization of political power, etc. Early in 1929, the Front Committee of the Fourth Army of the Red Army published these resolutions in book form for distribution to the party organizations in the Red Army and to the local party organizations. Back to the main text and on to section 7, the technique of investigation. 1. Hold fact-finding meetings and undertake investigation through discussions. This is the only way to get near the truth, the only way to draw conclusions. It is easy to commit mistakes if you do not hold fact-finding meetings for investigation through discussions, but simply rely on one individual relating his own experience. You cannot possibly draw more or less correct conclusions at such meetings if you put questions casually instead of raising key questions for discussion. 2. What kind of people should attend the fact-finding meetings? They should be people well acquainted with social and economic conditions. As far as age is concerned, older people are best because they are rich in experience and not only know what is going on, but understand the causes and effects. Young people with experience of struggle should also be included because they have progressive ideas and sharp eyes. As far as occupation is concerned, there should be workers, peasants, merchants, intellectuals, and occasionally soldiers, and sometimes even vagrants. Naturally, when a particular subject is being looked into, those who have nothing to do with it need not be present. For example, workers, peasants, and students need not attend when commerce is the subject of investigation. 3. Which is better, a large fact-finding meeting or a small one? That depends on the investigator's ability to conduct a meeting. If they're good at it, a meeting of as many as a dozen or even 20 or more people can be called. A large meeting has its advantages. From the answers, you get fairly accurate statistics, e.g. in finding out the percentage of poor peasants in the total peasant population, and fairly correct conclusions e.g. in finding out whether equal or differentiated land redistribution is better. Of course, it has its disadvantages too. Unless you are skillful in conducting meetings, you will find it difficult to keep order. So, the number of people attending a meeting depends on the competence of the investigator. However, the minimum is three, or otherwise the information obtained will be too limited to correspond to the real situation. Four. 
Prepare a detailed outline for the investigation. A detailed outline should be prepared beforehand, and the investigator should ask questions according to the outline, with those present at the meeting giving their answers. Any points which are unclear or doubtful should be put up for discussion. The detailed outline should include main subjects and subheadings and also detailed items. For instance, taking commerce as a main subject, it can have such subheadings as cloth, grain, other necessities, and medicinal herbs. Again, under cloth, there can be such detailed items as calico, homespun, and silk and satin. 5. Personal Participation Everybody with responsibility for giving leadership, from the chairman of the township government to the chairman of the central government, from the detachment leader to the commander-in-chief, from the secretary of a party branch to the general secretary, must personally undertake investigation into the specific social and economic conditions and not merely rely on reading reports. For investigation and reading reports are two entirely different things. 6. Probe deeply. Anyone new to investigation work should make one or two thorough investigations in order to gain full knowledge of a particular place, say a village or a town, of a particular problem, say the problem of grain or currency. Deep probing into a particular place or problem will make future investigation of other places or problems easier. 7. Make your own notes. The investigator should not only preside at fact-finding meetings and give proper guidance to those present, but should also make his own notes and record the results himself. To have others do it for him is no good. That is the end of the audiobook. So, what did you think? Leave a comment below. Do you have questions? Leave those below as well. We'll continue it down in the comment section. My thoughts. Um, I probably would have gone with a different title on this one, Opposed Book Worship. Like, I get it. It's all about doing investigation and going beyond just the word of others or assumptions. I, I don't know. Maybe something like on the importance of investigating the actual situation. Whatever. Anyway, I'm not here to retitle the thing. It just, uh, I wouldn't have gotten really the essence out of this uh, from opposed book worship. But anyway, this was a really large amount of useful information in a condensed space. And I think that people can get a lot out of this very compact set of guidelines and recommendations. That's one thing I think that comes across in Mao's writings in general is there's a real comfortability with giving command or, you know, having an authoritative perspective and just kind of laying that down, do this. You know, it's firm guidance. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Contrasting with something like Marx or Lenin, I think that you get a lot more analysis, you know, from Marx, especially you get a lot of satire. Also from Lenin, you get a lot of satire and analysis and also a lot of scathing criticism. From Mao, I mean, you get some of those things as well. There's also a lot more the tone to me seems to be more one of guidance, instruction, command. It's a lot more direct. And that may just have been a function of where his head was at, uh, you know, fulfilling his other duties as a communist in the struggle at that point, which was obviously ongoing. And he was, in fact, commanding large amounts of people. Anyway, this is not a better than, worse than thing, just a difference. And I think that you can kind of get slightly different things out of this than you can some of the other major Marxist writers. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Again, questions, comments, as always, we'll continue the discussion below. Otherwise, thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful. So thank you very much deeply to all the patrons. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to help out without making a donation, liking, subscribing, clicking the notifications bell, leaving a comment, even if it's just good video or thanks, helps to boost the channel in the YouTube algorithm, helps to bring more people into this discussion, and it is a discussion we need to have about building proletarian power to, in the short term, refuse unsafe conditions and assert our presence, and in the long term, to oppose and end capitalism and then begin to build socialism. We got a way to go, so back in the real world, join an organization, or at least contribute to one if you aren't ready to join yet. My general recommendations are to look for an organization 
that is active and doing useful work in your area that also responds promptly when you contact them. These are all signs of an organization that is not going to be a time suck and maybe a big frustrating headache, as sometimes, let's be honest, orgs can be. So we want to avoid that and make the most of everyone's time. Nobody wants to waste time, particularly now in this really critical and difficult time. Solidarity to everyone's struggles and thanks for everything that you're doing to contribute to the cause of socialism. Thanks again for listening and we'll catch you in the next video.